<laughs> Memorial Day. Here we are at Memorial Day. What a sad day in Texas. A Memorial Day that should be a, a great celebration and a great honor to great things. Not only do we have a tragedy there, but we got another, another political war going on over it. It seems like people can't set things aside just to mourn and do right things anymore. So we're going to pray for the people of Texas, especially those, so many that lost small children. People often ask me as a pastor, Pastor, what's the difference between sin and evil? I mean, the average guy in the street knows the difference between sin and evil. What we saw in Texas was evil. Agreed? I mean, if anybody thinks that was not evil. What I'm afraid of in America, that we, if evil becomes commonplace, kind of like sin did in my day. You know, when I was in high school up in Michigan, in Podunk, Michigan, just about everybody by their junior year you know, we drove trucks, man, we drove trucks to school. We all had a rifle. Nobody thought about not having a rifle. And not one time do I ever know of that rifle being not used, but in a proper way. And we never heard of this stuff, right? Now it's just become everyday news, you know, it doesn't even affect us. We say, well, 400 people, Bill, 400 people that week, last weekend or something, killed in Chicago. I say that because they lived there for a while. I mean, who ever heard of such things? When I was a young man growing up, at college age, we used to go to Chicago. You could walk anywhere, any time of the day in Chicago downtown. The last thing, I mean, you'd see a burly big old cop step up and they, he put out, he put out fires. Yeah, not anymore. So we got to pray. What, here's my prayer. Well, I, I pray for all this all the time, and I know you do too. We're in trouble in America. We're in trouble. We got to vote better, for sure. <laughs> and we got to take a stronger march. We got to take. We got to be on a march for Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, people want to know. Well, when did the gun become a bigger issue in the school than a school book? I'm going to tell you when. When they took God out of it. When they threw God under the school bus. Because I I used to walk into schools all the time and talk about Christ especially in the South. The South should not give up that. If they want their money, let them have their money. Don't give up that. And so here's my prayer for this next year, because this school year is over. We have got to get after it in St. Clair County. We got to get after it. We need to put God in the school system for sure. Our kid, the great protector of our children is God Almighty. We need to have a real concerted. So I want you to pray about this. We've all, two years ago, we were in some, some schools. Willie's already got a foot in the doors of many of them. We need to go after these schools and put Christ back in the center place of it. The only hope for us, the only hope for us is God. And the only way to bring you to God is through Jesus Christ. No man can come to the Father except through the Son. The church must never back down from that. We must never water that idea down. We can be bold against. So we need to take this back. Our generation needs to take it back. We lost it in the 80s, 90s, and beyond. We lost it. Church set on their hands. We lost it. So let's have a word of prayer today and we'll get in our morning study. But I'm asking you to really pray for us over this summer 
that God would open doors of people in the school system that know that God's the answer, really know it. And if they'll do that, they'll see, they will see God step into schools and do miraculous things. Because I've seen it in the past. So I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit to confess sin if necessary and to go to the Father through the Holy Spirit in prayer. Pray for the people of Texas. It's affected everybody. A, a mass footprint of evil has affected the entire state and it's awakened the entire South and I don't know if it's awakened the nation, but it sure has awakened the South. It sure has awakened me to the schools in St. Clair. Our Father, we know that the answer is not more guns in the school, not more fences, not more separation. It's God. God. God needs to be in the school ahead of an 18-year-old to try to get him to find some peace in his life in the midst of turmoil. They have PTAs that used to open in prayer and, and talk about the importance of God. Pray for St. Clair County. We're not, we'd be ahead of this. We're probably already behind it. We need to get ahead of it, Father. We need to take care of our, our babies here. And we pray for it everywhere. I pray there is a great awakening in the South that there should be. The great Bible Belt that sends missionaries all over the world needs to start sending them to their communities into their schools and into the highway and the hedges. Open doors for us and give us courage to do, do what is on our plate to do, and that's to bring the gospel. It changed every one of our lives. It will change every one of theirs. We need to be bold with it. So I pray today, Father, you would help us prepare ourselves for it as a church, as a congregation. Open those doors. Give us the boldness to be faithful to preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the generation that we're responsible for, and especially these small babies, these children, Father. It breaks my heart to see this. And so I, I want to do something about it. I want to do something about it in St. Clair, so give us that privilege, Father. Give us the boldness and whatever else it might take to do this. What has happened to us, Father, in America is a disgrace. I pray that you would give us the courage to send the message strong and that other brothers in the Lord that really know this would say enough is enough and they would begin to take it to the highway and the hedges, the message of truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, no sense me telling you to turn to Genesis, Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. Because by now you should have that memorized because we're in our ninth lesson. We have paused between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2 to tell you all the things that occurred before we could ever get to the foundation of the world or the creation story in Genesis 1, 3. Just to remind you of a few things that we have discussed that are, are in between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. We've talked about the Eternal Life Conference. That's a very important doctrine. In fact, we are still running off from that doctrine today. <clears throat> the Bible came out of that, both in the first what we would call the Old Testament, and then the New Testament came out of that. Uh, the centerpiece of the plan was that, Jesus, that, that Christ, the Son of God, would become flesh and dwell among men. 
would go to a cross and die for the sins of humanity, would be buried and raised on the dead the third day, ascend back and be seated at the right hand of God the Father. And from that comes in enormous promises to us. For example, one promise that you and I have from this experience is that to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. When a believer dies, he goes up into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was never true prior to him doing that. It was never true. There are so many privileges that we have. As the Son of God, He's our Daddy, and we have access to Him at any hour, at any time, with any request. We are all indwelt by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The third member of the Godhead lives with inside our body. That's never been true. We have a completed canon of Scripture. We know from the front to the end of human history... We know when it began. We know how it will conclude because we have the Bible. We are such a blessed people. So we, we studied this as uh, that aspect. We studied about the fall of Satan, how that affected Genesis 1-2 with the darkness, the domain of Satan, how it came into existence, uh, what the, why the water circled the earth like the darkness did, and how that was kept in place by the ministry of the Holy Spirit in verse 2. Uh, we talked about how the domain of darkness got into the world through that, through the fall of Satan. We've talked about that. We talked about the creation of the abyss that occurred in that period. Now we're talking about the angelic conflict. We're talking about the angelic conflict. This is part one. Uh, next week, we'll do part two on it. People often don't know that a lot of things happen between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 that affect our whole world system and the church. And so I wanted to stop and do a discussion about that with you. And so I've done nine doctrines. I've done nine doctrines with you. We start with the book of Genesis and we go to the book of Revelation. All of that eternal life conference. In between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, I'm going to do 10 studies with you. I'm going to do 10 studies with you before I ever get to creation story because that much, that much happened and became part of history. Okay? So I wanted you to know that what's happened between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 is very important to the lives we live today. So we have learned from Genesis 1, 1 and 2 the Eternal Life Conference the world creation. And I find this really interesting. I put that on your paper. At the Eternal Life Conference, before the world ever began, Genesis, I mean, 1 Peter 1.20 says, For he, Christ, who would be the Son of God, who is identified by Peter as the Lamb of God, in other words, the sacrificial Lamb of God at the Eternal Life Conference, was foreknown before the foundation of the world. There's your eternal life conference. Watch this now. And you should circle this word appeared, but has appeared. The Christ that was picked to be the Lamb of God, the sacrificial sacrifice in eternity past, has, has appeared into human history in what's called the last times of human history the last times of human history. When the rapture comes, we can start a countdown of time. Right? Seven years, a thousand years. We've talked about that. We have learned that between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, the fall of Satan occurred to cause the threefold conditions of the earth to be chaotic which is described in Isaiah 45, 18, is uninhabitable. We chose, I chose, to study Revelation, the 12th chapter, to give you a panoramic view 
of the fall of Satan in the origin of it to the conclusion of it when he is cast into the lake of fire. That's why I chose that passage. Today we will learn that the fall of Satan was the cause of the spiritual war between God and Satan, the elect angels and the fallen angels, that we refer to as the angelic conflict in our theology. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on the left, this comes out of the eternal life conference, he will say to those on the left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, abyss, prepared for the devil and his angels, lake of fire. They will go to the abyss and then they'll go to the lake of fire. We've studied that. If you missed that study, go back, to our, go back to our website and pick it up and become current. Revelation, the 20th chapter, 10 through uh, 15, talks about his final th throwdown. Uh, he will be thrown into the lake of fire. And we've talked about that. Today I'm going to talk about three aspects of the origin of the angelic conflict because that's what we participate in every day of our life. We participate as believers in the church age in the angelic conflict. This, this angelic conflict goes back to eternity past with the rebellion of Satan. Now we're in it. We're engaged in it. And it's important that you know how to fight and win in the angelic conflict. So I've got three aspects. What is interesting to me in 1 Peter, going back to 1 Peter 1.20 at the top of your paper, it says that he was foreknown before the foundation of the world to be the sacrificial lamb. Agreed? Yeah, well, you have to read a little more, but you can find it. But has appeared in these last times, right? Write this on your paper, Galatians 4.4. 4. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. The fulfillment of time was decreed in eternity past at the eternal life conference. And just like all of the plan of God, it works out in time by the decree of God and by the genius of God, his sovereignty, his omniscience, always working on our behalf. When he appeared in human history, now listen to me. When Jesus Christ appeared in human history, which comes out of the Eternal Life Conference, at the fullness of time in history, agreed? He was foreknown to be the Lamb of God. He was foreknown at the Eternal Life Conference. That's 1 Peter 1.20. When he appears, he appears as a baby, agreed? Born at Bethlehem, the Christmas story. Bethlehem's Christmas story. The very next Christmas, the, the very next year after his birth, Herod does what? Try to, kill. Try to kill him. Now guess who guess who's promoting that agenda? Right? Now, he doesn't come out and take, take credit for it yet because it didn't work. Right? Because God did, did for him what God does for you. God did for his son what he does for you as a child of God. Right? Protects you. God gave him a heads up ahead of time. And they got away from him, didn't they? They went to Egypt. Look, do you not know that God is always a step ahead of you? Is clearing the path for you to move forward? Is taking care of all the logistics that are on your next day schedule? Do you not know that? Listen to me. This is why you're told to walk by faith and not by sight. You walk by faith today, and it takes care of your tomorrow, 
And when tomorrow comes, you walk by faith and it takes care of your tomorrow. And that's how you get from this point to the end of your life. You walk by faith and not by sight. Faith says, I believe God has got my path covered. I believe he's, got, he's figured out everything in front of me. So listen, when you go to bed at night and you've had one of those days that stress is still all over you and you can't sleep because you're stressful, right? You shouldn't do that. You say, well, Ron, how could I help from doing that? Write this down. 1 Peter 5, 6, 7, and 8. That's how you solve it. You don't reach up and grab some drugs. I mean, God knows your sleep pattern. He's the one that developed it. Would you agree with that? You have a sleep pattern. Deep sleep, we all know how important that is to your life. When a person says, I didn't have a good rest, I didn't get a good night's sleep, it means he didn't get into deep sleep to the amount he needed. So you don't feel rested. You only feel rested when you do that. But listen, rested is kind of an interesting word because God uses it same program, right? Faith what? Rest. rest. I mean, you can have faith, but you might not have rest. So you got to faith rest. And you leave it in the hands of God. It means you leave it in the hands of God because who's got your, all of your tomorrows? God. He's got all your tomorrows. And he's got them all planned out. And whatever you went through today that caused you a little stress means that you, you, you ended the day with too much sight, not enough faith. That's just that simple. This, this is not brain surgery kind of stuff. Would you, do you understand that? There's no reason for you to go to bed and be full, with stress. Get, get, 1 Peter 5, 6, 7, and 8. Do that and go to bed. Because who has your tomorrow? You're worried about, look, you're worried about, you, let, you got some leftover from today for tomorrow. L listen, your tomorrow's already taken care of. Sign off on today and go to bed and sleep because tomorrow's another, we say, well, tomorrow's another day. Yeah, and, and God has it. He had, today, he had today, but you got off track by walking by faith. You got track, off track by walking by sight. And that's what happens to you. You say, well, Ron, that's human nature. Yes, but you have to be, you have to be divine about it. Yeah, sure, the world, that's the way the world lives. But that's not the way you should live. Listen, that's how you turn stress into good. You stress. E U S T R E S S. Good stress. Stress is good. It, it flexes your, your spiritual muscles, it puts you into the Word of God, it puts you into the faith of the Word of God. That God has got all of your todays and all of your tomorrows. And, and sometimes he just holds you for a moment to remind you that this life is a life of faith. I mean, the first thing Satan tries to do when Jesus appears... And the Magi come in and tells King that there's a king in competition and he's the king of the Jew and yeah, 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 yeah. He puts a contract out. He kills, listen, he kills all, listen. Because it's going to ring a bell in, in Texas. He killed all the what? Babies. Killed all the babies. Killed all the babies. And God took every one of them. God took every one of those babies into his presence. Not one of those babies died without the presence of God. Not one of those little children in Texas that got murdered died without the presence and the power of God in that transfer. Not one. 
Evil never triumphs. Never let it triumph. Evil should never triumph. Good people should stand up and call it what it is and tell the truth about it. Jesus Christ now is full grown and he's ready to begin his ministry. Go to Matthew, the fourth chapter. And guess who shows up again? Now Jesus has made a second appearance. That's historical importance. His second historical importance is to introduce, be introduced by John the Baptist and begin his own ministry. Do you understand? We're in Matthew 4. In Matthew 4, the devil shows up the second time. And pay attention to this. I put it on your paper as well. I walked you through some of this. Let me get four. Now he's ready to go. John has baptized him in the third chapter. And a voice out of heaven has declared, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus is now to begin his ministry headed to Golgotha to pay the wages of sin of the human race. Then Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the, tempers, the tempter shows up. Verse 3, the tempter came and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The devil, notice he was called the temp tempter, right? Now he's called the devil, just so you don't confuse him. Then the devil took him into a holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. It is written. He quotes scripture to Jesus. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands, on their hands, or in their trust, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. The devil, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, Jesus, Satan says to Jesus, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, go, Satan. It was more like, go, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now let me tell you three things that I think is important you walk away with from that. Because we fight this guy. As a member of the church of Jesus Christ, as a member of the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, this is a guy we fight. We fight him every day of our life. Huh? So there's some things we should walk away with how to beat the devil at his own game. How to beat him. So I broke this down into three sections of the attack on Christ. He attacked Christ three times. He attacked him personally and face to face. Now you, you, you've got to understand that. Jesus Christ was personally engaged directly in the angelic conflict by Satan as Jesus prepared his earthly ministry to go to Golgotha. Here's the first attack, verse 3. Here's what this says in the Greek language that's important. If is a first-class condition. In the proper order, this is called a, a, a protasis. 
The if is always out first, and then the hypothesis is the then, if then. Do you have that? Always an if and then the then. This is a first class, which means if it's true in the if, then it's true in the then. Do you understand that? All right, watch this. Satan says to Jesus, if you are the son of God, and we both know that's true, command these stones become bread, and we know that would be true, because if you're the son of God, you can do that. Right? So what he wanted him to do was to use his divine power to give him a loaf of bread. You understand that? Jesus is never supposed to use his divine powers, nor you and I, for our own benefit. Watch this. So Jesus, watch, it, watch pay attention to his answer in verse 4. Watch this answer. He answered, it is written, and he quotes Deuteronomy 8.3, man shall not live by what? A what? Mm -hmm. Alone. Right? Life doesn't consist just of food. It's not just about bread. That's your first mistake you just made with me, Bubba. That's what Jesus is saying to him. That's the first mistake you just made with me. My life doesn't consist of things of this world. See, bread's just a detail of life, isn't it? It's not the source. It's just a detail. Man shall not live by bread alone. <clears throat> Satan put all of his chips on it, right? Turn the stones into what? He wanted, he wanted Jesus to throw all, you know, throw the dice up against the wall business. He went, I ain't doing that. Watch this. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You know what's better than bread? You know what's better than details of life? Word of the Word of God. See, you get all hung up over details. You worry at night. When you worry at, at night, it's not about God. It's about details. I've never seen anybody lay at night and worry about God. They worry about details of life. Listen. He's given you the word to take care of the bread of life, right? You know, that's not what you, you, you get all wound up over details of life. You can listen, you can lose all the details and never lose your life. Did you know that? You might think you would just read the book of Job. If you can stand it. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, so what, here's what he did. He quoted Deuteronomy 8.3. He cleared the devil's mistake with him. You've made a, a critical error. I mean, he tells him, you know, you're supposed to be this smart fighter. You've made a critical error in your attack against me. You think I care about details of life. I'll tell you what I care about. The word of God. Agreed? Watch this. So he attacks him a second time. Verses 5 and 6. In verse 5, 6, he goes, if, and he does a first class Gishon, if that's true, then the other's true. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, and Satan quotes Psalms 91, 11, and 12. He quotes, he, that's what he quotes. He's got him on top of this pinnacle of the temple, throw yourself down. He, 
and, and he, quote, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands or authority they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. See, if you have a study Bible, he, he, he quotes Psalms 91, 11, and 12. And he, 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 oh, oh, I see, you want to argue the word, right? Jesus said, it's not about details, about the word, agreed? Oh, I see. Oh, I see. You want to play Eve with me. Now we're playing Eve. I can play with Eve. Yeah. I can do that. I can do that. Right? So he calls, he calls scripture back to him. You've got access. You've got access to all the angels, the elect angels. You have all the elect angels. I have all the fallen angels. Oh, I understand. Oh, it's about Bible. Well, let's talk Bible then. Here's what Jesus said. On the other hand, it's written. Yes, you quoted an excellent scripture. I do have access to all the elect angels. They're on my team. I got all of them. You got all the fallen ones. I got all the elect ones. Right? Right? That's not what it's about. This is what he says. On the other hand, it's written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And he quotes Deuteronomy 6.16. Listen to what he says. We both know you're slick. You're talking to the wrong guy. You think I care about that? Do you think that the fact that I got access to all the angels, there'll come a day, there will come a day when you will bring me that challenge and my angel will put such a serious whipping on you, it'll be unmerciful. That day's coming, big boy. You've hit the right scripture on that. That day will come and it will bite you for eternity. But that's not now. I got bigger fish to fry than you. Watch what he says. Watch what he says. You shall not put the Lord your God to test. Look how he addressed himself to Satan. Who do you think you're talking to, bud? think you're talking to quote the scripture to me like that I give you credit you're slick but you're dumb you have no idea who you're talking to you've spent so much time in the evil you forgot what good is about it. how he addressed himself to him you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Quote me scripture. I was part of writing it all. That's eternal life conference stuff. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? I love it. Yeah, quote me scripture. That's okay, but let me tell you what you just did. You just tested the Lord your God, and you know, the, how does that work out? You understand what he just said back to Satan? How did that work out? When you let a revolt in heaven and took a third of the angels and rebelled against us in heaven, how did that work out? When you tested the Lord your God, how did that work out for you, Bubba? You understand the conversation going on? Well, I'm just trying to help. Watch the third attack. Old, old Slick comes out. Satan goes like, oh, wow, he's pretty good. This guy's pretty good. I mean, he, he debates pretty good. Watch what he does. This Satan is so, listen, one of the words you need to pay attention to is deceptive. 
One of the characteristics of Satan is that he's deceptive. He got Eve by deception. Oh, when you read the account, like in 1 Timothy 2, watch what he does. In verse 8 and 9, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to Jesus, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Oh, 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 you've missed this. You've missed this. Look at the order of this sentence. Is the if at the beginning or at the end? Is the, is the word if at the beginning of it or at the end of it? It's at the end. It's supposed to be where? It's supposed to be at the beginning. Look at the other two. Look, I wrote them on your paper so you wouldn't miss it. See, if you are the Son of God, uh, 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 if you are the Son of God, see that both times? See what I mean? Put it up first. Agreed? He didn't do it this time, though. He's trying to trick him. He's trying to deceive him. He's trying to trick him. You know? This is the guy who deals and, you know, pulls one out and puts in his shirt sleeve that nobody can see it, you know, playing cards. He sticks it. Peggy knows about this stuff. She grew up with a family like this. Peggy Baxter. <laughs> Whoever won theirs could cheat the best, right, Peggy? Uh, that's the stories I've heard from all the children. This is what he thinks. He thinks he can, he can st stick a couple cards up here just in case Jesus gets lucky and whip them out and go like, I got a full house. See what I mean? He's trying to trick them. Not only that, but watch this. Watch this. This is a third class condition. This is a third class condition. All these things I will give you if is a third class condition. You know what this makes this? This makes this a proposition. He says, let's make a deal. See, th listen, the devil always thinks he can get you cheap. If he can buy you for, for 20 pieces of silver, he'd buy, he'll sell you. If he can buy you for 30, he'll sell you because there's not enough money in the world to buy Jesus. Agreed? There's not enough money in the world to buy Jesus. There's not enough money in the world to buy him. But Judas sold him on for 30. He's always, he, he, he's a deceiver. He's always, got, he's always got to trick up his sleeve. And the cheaper you can get you for the greatest amount is the more guilt that comes from it. The more the pain comes from. I was so stupid. What made me do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you sit around beating yourself up. He likes that game too. This is a third class condition. That makes that a proposition. Well, let me let me offer you a proposition. Is what he's saying. All these things I will give you on this condition. And he shows him, he shows him the wonderful pie that he's just baked, right? <laughs> I guess he went from bread to pie. I don't know. That's what I do. I go from the man. Let's just skip the bread. And let's just go to the pie. You know, sometimes I just look at the pie and go like, let's just skip the, let me have a piece of pie and then we'll see how the meal goes. All these things I will give you is a proposition because of third class condition on this condition, you fall down and worship me. Let me tell you, you know what the devil's bottom line for his scheme of warfare is to get you to worship him. And that's what caused the rebellion in eternity past. He wanted people to worship him and not God. That's the pride he had. And that's what this whole warfare is about because he can't win it. except through your volition, one by one. So he hits him with a proposal. He hits him with a proposal. He is, he, he is the most deceptive people, person you'll ever meet in your life. You've met a lot of them. 
by now. You've met a lot of, lot of, lot of slick guys, a lot of slick gals. You ain't met anybody as good as this guy. And you can beat them. You, but every time you can beat them with what? The Word of God. Pay attention to Jesus' answer. Watch his answer. Go, Satan. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. He, say, he, said to what, he said to Satan the same thing he said to Peter. In, in Matthew, the 16th chapter, 21 through 23, he said to him, get behind me, Satan. He told Satan to get out of my face. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Isn't that good? Is that, is that not a good reminder to you and I? You worship the Lord God through Jesus Christ and you serve him only. What a wonderful... Let's get this. We, we, we won't get any further than this. I'm nearly out of time. How did Jesus beat the devil straight up and straight down by the plan of God? How did he do it? He has to do it correctly, agreed? He has to do it by the book. That's how did he beat him. He fought him three, three big battles, and he bought him, beat him every time. How did he do it? The Word of God. Not only that, but listen to me. Listen to me carefully. It wasn't just he took the Bible and slapped him. Listen, the devil's smarter than that. He beat him with categorical Bible doctrine. Right? He laid back a specific verse to nail him with. That's categorical Bible doctrine. He hit him with categorical Bible doctrine. You can't, listen, devil, if you say, well, I go to Bible study, I got a Bible, I got a good one too. And you think you're going to beat him by holding the Bible up and say, you better run because I got a Bible in my hand. He'll beat you to death. Because he can quote what you can't. And you better be on your game. And listen, you'll be on your game through the Holy Spirit of God in John 14, 26, what he teaches you, he can recall. <clears throat> what a wonderful... And here's the victory. And the devil did what in verse 11? Eh? He didn't want any more of that. Right? He didn't want any more of that. And listen, in the end, he obeyed Christ. What did Christ tell him to do? He said, go away, Satan. Just go away. I don't know how he said it. I said it loud. Now I'm saying it soft. I don't know how he said it. But he did say, go away, didn't he? And did he? Listen, did he? Yeah, he beat him. But he beat him with the word of God. He didn't. He, Satan says, oh, I know, you're the, I know you're the Lord. I know you're the head. I know, I know you're God's favorite. So I I beat him. He didn't pull his, oh, let me pull my identity. I'm the son of God. And the devil go like, I'll eat that card to you with it. Well, he beat him with the word of God. He's in his humanity, and you have to beat the devil in your humanity with the word of God. Agreed? Let's look at Ephesians. In this great passage, and most of you know it, put on the full armor of God in Ephesians 6. We are told this. We are told this. In Ephesians 6, 17, in the full armor of God, in the story of the, full, in the, the account of here, if you're going you're gonna to fight an angelic conflict, listen, you're going to fight an angelic conflict. He's going to fight you. Whether you fight back or not, he's still going to get you. You can beat him every time. Every time? Jesus beat him every time? Did Jesus beat him every time? Yes. All right. Did he do it with the same thing that you got in your possession? Yes. The Word of God, except you got to know how to do it categorical. He's going to hit you on subjects. When he hits you on subjects, you got to be able to nail it. Right? You don't have to worry about what you don't know. You have to worry about what you do know. He's not going to hit you on what you don't know. He's going to hit you on what you do know. 
There's a prize in that, you see. That's the prize. You're the prize. I'm the prize. Here's verse 17. Stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, which you shall be able to distinguish all the flaming arrows of the devil. And you love that? Huh? The shield of faith, right? Jesus had the shield of faith on? Where's faith come from? Word of God. Word of God. Hearing, hearing the word of God. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation, right? And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Spirit is able to give it to you and bring it out of you. You understand that? John 14, 26. What we have to come out of this study with today, understanding, is that the spiritual offensive weapon that always brings victory to the Christian way of life against Satan is identified in Ephesians 6, 19, as 6, 17, as the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. Okay? Well, you can read the rest, right? Because I'm, I'm out of time. It's, it's time to have a cup of coffee. And the angels say, that was one amazing meal. Yeah. You know what? I didn't, I didn't have time to talk about this subject matter, but, you know, when... when when Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, right, and Peter draws the sword and says, I'm here to defend you, you know, to the bitter end and all that. Jesus told him to put up his sword because he could have done what? He could have called legions of angels, couldn't he? He could have. But he didn't because he had to go to the cross alone for you and I. Think about that. I mean, that's a marvelous sacrifice. I could have called him, he said, but I didn't. We're on that team, though. <laughs> We're on the team with the guy who's got all the angels that he can call, and one day he will. So, our Father, we thank you today for these that have come and listened to attentively to our study on the angelic conflict and how it's personal. It was with Jesus. It will be with the, with the same sons of God in Christ. A warning to us how to do, win the victory in our personal life. Christ won it for us, but we have to fight it out. We, we've got to do it by faith. Categorical Bible doctrine. We can win. We can win every day, every way, and we thank you for it. We pray, for that, Father, for the offering that's about to be taken, that you would give us good sense about it, to reach as many as we can for Christ, so that when he comes back, he has more people to take all the things that we have that are details of this church here will be left. And so we strive for what you really care about in that souls, both home and abroad. Again, Father, we thank you for your love and mercy and grace. Give those people in Texas a big hug from us in Alabama, if you would because our hearts ache and it's a wake-up call for us to not let it come here. We've got to be ahead of it. We've got to be reaching young people and protecting children. In Jesus' name, amen.